reading it for you. Uh, 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 let me just make this quick announcement and we'll get into this. May lose the signal. Uh, if, if we do, we will likely postpone until tomorrow uh, uh, um, due to inclement weather that is hitting the area. Of course, uh, uh, we know all over the central part of the United States, this has been going on flooding. So we're getting our share of some of this weather. So again, let me just say we may uh, lose our signal. It's having an effect on, on my internet service uh, here in my home location. So if that does happen, uh, uh, we will likely have to pick this up tomorrow. Uh, we shall see because we're actually due to get this kind of weather for the next several several days, actually. So let's let's try to get into this and see where we how far we can get along. So we've been dealing with, we introduced last week, a, a really a continuing of the last uh, a series we did of lessons, about nine weeks worth of lessons dealing with uh, what has been lost has been restored. And we even make reference to it here this evening. We, we, we picked up a supplement, if you will, uh, lesson called Good Works. And this is part two of that. So let me officially welcome you to uh, the Victory in Christ broadcasting channel. And of course, on Tuesday nights at 9 Central Standard Time, our program is called Our Time to Grow. And I am your host, Gabriel Matthews. Let's again jump right in. We don't know if our signal is going to stay with us. So let's let's do this. I gave some definitions on, in part one. And I went back, Just I didn't feel confident about it. I, I re-looked it up. I, I, sometimes you got to do that. Uh, even as a teacher, and I, I believe this will be more uh, 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 works is what we gave you. Here, let's give it again before we dig in. Uh, Thayer's lexicon defines the term contextually as referring to all manner of good works. So there's a change there, all manner of good works. Now, you'll, if you recall, and if you don't, go back and look at the last week's broadcast, all manner of good works, such as uh, uh, piety, supporting others, or being a benefactor, or of uh, the law and of law-abiding citizens, etc. So, what we see in in this particular passage, Ephesians chapter. If you're wondering, let me read it for you. For we are all His creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time, so that we should walk in them for good works. And we're defining that term works uh, from a biblical standpoint. And so what when we went back, because we it seemed kind of limited. So we looked at how Paul uses that term uh, that in the Greek, uh, ergos, ergon, uh, uh, er, where we get ergonomics from. We realized that, that right there, it's a broader use, which includes all the type of works. Matter of fact, all things working out here we'll be dealing with starting on next week. Uh, so, so, so it, again, it deals with the works of piety, the works of supporting others, the works of being a law abiding citizen, etc. Again, we'll deal with next week. Nelson's Bible Dictionary simply, and I'm giving you this one again, simply says they are acts or deeds. So now it fits together better. Nelson notes works as discussed in scripture as pertaining to humans are either categorized as bad or good, righteous or unrighteous. That's what Nelson says. Uh, uh, we, we surmise then that to the Christian, his or her in, impact on others for good to the glory of God is herein what is meant by works. Good works uh, uh, to the benefit uh, uh, of the impacting of others to the glory of God. All right. Now, we, we, last week, please go check out that broadcast, part one. We had to deal with salvation by grace through faith, excuse me, and not of yourselves, because that's, that was the setup for what we see in verse 10. So we had to engage verses 8, 9, before we could understand fully what's going on in 10. And we won't go back through that, and uh, uh, again, weather permitting us to maintain our broadcast. So let's go ahead and go on forward. Uh, understanding how we concluded the matter at that time was with this note. And I think this will help us transition perfectly. We noted, uh, we talked about James chapter 2, and there was a note given right at the end, if you recall, of that broadcast. Here it is, if you missed it. 
No, the works James speaks of, James chapter 2, verses 21 through 26, uh, uh, speaks of here are the works of faith. Abraham and Rahab had faith and demonstrated their faith by what they did, the actions, the deeds, all right? As stated earlier in the chapter of James chapter 2, I show my faith by my works. So I just wanted to put that in your hearing because it's going to come up in our lesson on this evening. So now let's move forward. We all have work to do. We all have work to do. Good works. We all have, matter of fact, I could have put, we all have good works to do. It is here then where we must turn. Here is where we must go now that the relationship once lost between creator and creature has been restored. So you can see the connection between that nine part series dealing with, with, with that particular lesson connects to this one. So once we have the relationship restored, we've got to turn our attention to good works, to the issues of, of good works. We ought to desire to know and understand what Paul mean, meant, excuse me, when he wrote, here it is again, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. So that we should walk in them. There are a few implications that we got to deal with before we get into actually seeing what the scriptures call call these works or itemize these works to be. There's a few implications in the very passage we just read from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, uh, implications of Paul's words which must be made clear and understood as necessary. Whatever these words, uh, uh, so, so whatever these works, they are only for a selected group as identified. Uh, 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 so, so the first implication is this. Whatever these works may be, and again, hopefully we're able to finish the broadcast tonight. So whatever these works may be, one of the things that's implied by Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 is this, that whatever the works, they are only for a select group here identified as, notice what it says, his creation created in Christ Jesus. His creation created in Christ Jesus. By the way, we're working Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And we're going to take three implications from that particular text. And next week, all things considered, we'll get into what the works are. All right. So, so this clearly means that this does not include all humanity. Again, he's dealing with a group, his creation created in Christ Jesus. His creation as qualified by created in Christ Jesus. See it? So then this clearly means that this is not re including all humanity. As previous as the previous series, which we're going to keep referring to, revealed, that's the D DR or divine relationships number two, what was lost has been restored. Please go back and I'm going to keep referring to it. Hopefully, if you haven't looked at any of the parts or all of the parts, you'll be encouraged to go do so. Faith is the means by which this group of individuals, often called Christians, experience the re reconnection between them and their creator and then subsequently and willfully place themselves at the mercy of the will of their creator let me do that again so so considering the fact this is not all humanity this is not every single person uh, uh, as previously discussed in in the previous lessons uh, dealing with that title what was lost has been restored we understand then that faith is the means by which this group of individuals often call Christians experience the reconnection. So that reconnection of the relationship lost that is now restored comes via faith. And again, even noted in our passage, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8, 9, 10, uh, here, saved by grace through faith, through faith, and we talked about last week, faith is the conduit uh, uh, that grace operates, all right? And so, therefore, since that relationship has been restored between creator and creature, then subsequently and willfully, this places that the individuals who have been saved, I've been saved, you've been saved, we consequently or sub, sub, <laughs> uh, 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 subsequently or consequently 
and willfully place ourselves at the mercy of our creator. Once the relationship is restored, we then, like Adam and Eve, before the eating of the tree, we put ourselves back in a position of submission to do what we've been called to do. Note the word submission. Note our own savior is spoken of as one who willfully became a bond servant to the will of the father. He willfully became a bond servant to the will of the father. Philippians chapter two. If you ever followed my teaching for any period of time, I refer to this passage often starting at verse five. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Watch this. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So Jesus is the foremost model of the very thing we're talking about. Again, what did we say? Who subsequently and willfully placed themselves at the mercy of the will of their creator. And Jesus is the foremost. He's the firstborn born of many brethren, born from the dead, by the way. So, so many of the apostles and first century Christians counted themselves bond servants or slaves as well. Paul, James, Timothy, Peter, and Jude all classified themselves, classified themselves as such. You can see examples in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter there, verse 1. In other words, these works, whatever they may be, we'll deal with it next week, whatever they may be, are set aside for those who are true Christians, believers in Christ Jesus, and self-identified as slaves or bond servants of the Father. Again, in other words, these works, whatever they may be, are set aside for those who are true Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, and self-identified as slaves or bond servants of the Father. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 17. I'm, I'm telling you and going there myself. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 17. Here's what it says. Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, but thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were entrusted to. And having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. You became enslaved to righteousness. I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of the flesh, because we have a hard time grasping an understanding of it. He's saying you, 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 as, as human beings, we struggle with this. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now... So now, on purpose, intentionally, offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. Which results in sanctification. Again, what we understand that these works, talked about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and several other places, is it, clearly referring to those works that are for true believers. True Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, self-identified as slaves, once slaves to sin, slaves to immorality, now slaves to righteousness, slaves to Jesus Christ. Intentional bond servants, indentured servants. And again, this is analogous, right? You know that word slave is taboo, and rightfully so in some, some instances, but please understand the biblical implication. Another implication, so that's implication number one. Another implication is Paul's word, uh, in Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is that these works are an expression of God's divine power and provision as mandated by his sovereign will. Let me do that one again. Another implication in Paul's words, as found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is that these works 
are an expression of God's divine power and provision as mandated by his sovereign will. Not mandated by my will, not mandated by your will, not mandated by your pastor's will, not mandated by the Pope's will. No, as mandated by the will of God. It's mandated by the will of God. In other words, because they are the results of the intention of our creator, these works that he talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, I want to make sure I drive this home. These works he's talking about uh, are, are, in other words, the results of the intention of our creator. God and God alone must of himself give both power and provision so that his sovereign will can be carried out. Since these works come from him, he mandates himself, not I mandate him. He mandates himself. He mandates himself to provide power, uh, uh, to, to make provisions and give power so that those works can be carried out. If God mandates one to preach, then he must provide that one, the reservoir of words from which to draw their message. We call that the Holy Scripture the platform on which to present their message and the divine authority from which to declare their message. So if God says, I want Gabe to preach and to teach, which is not an office, it's a function. I want him to do this work of preaching. I want him to do this, then he's got to provide me what to preach. And I don't mean the particular message. I have to study and prepare the message. I have to rightly divide that scripture, but he has to give me the reservoir out of which I can, can, can glean the message, exegete the text. He's also got to give me the platform. He's got to de de determine where he wants me to present that message. And the platform doesn't mean necessarily in a church on, on a pulpit, on a raised platform. That's not exactly what that means. Seeing that Jesus spoke uh, of standing on a boat, standing on the side of a mountain. Moses spoke in the wilderness. So we have to understand that he, that, that if God, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So the first implication is that the works that he talks about in verse 10 are the works that, that are the results for those who are believers. Those good works, we'll look at that next week, are not for those who are not believers. It doesn't mean that there are not things that unbelievers cares who are among those who are the wheat, who are the true believers. There are not things that they can do. A, a flat out sinner can give an offering. I'm, I'm, I'm all in next week. Let me not do that. But the second thing now makes it more precise. The second implication of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is that God intends these works and therefore mandates himself. Not you and I mandate him. He mandates himself to give the power and the provision, the authority to complete his will. So if he wants Gabe to preach, or if he wants et cetera, et cetera, to preach, or to teach, or whatever the work may be, then he's going to give the, the, the necessary power. He's going to give the necessary provisions. He's going to give the necessary reservoir of scripture. We call it 66 books. He's going to give the Holy Scriptures as inspired by the whole no, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's also going to give the platform. He's going to tell Gabe where he wants to go, when what he wants to do, when he wants him to do it, and ultimately. He's going to make sure he has all the authority necessary that when he preaches the message, it will hit home. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 10, same book, Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, read as follows. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe without hearing about him? Here it is. And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how welcome are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. So that means God, since he has mandated for the people to hear the word of God, then he has to elect, the, he has to determine who he wants to send, excuse me, to declare that very message. Because how will they hear without a, how will they preach unless, see? So, so, so then if God wants that function in this case to be done, then God is the one who has the mandate, who has sets the mandate, gives a provision. I know a lot of him, my father says many uh, 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 were called, but some were called, but many just went. <laughs> some were sent, but many just went, uh, 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 moving on. 
So if God mandates uh, to give one, uh, for one to give alms, now stay with me. So not just preaching and teaching. I know everybody answering calls. Uh, uh, anyway, I won't deal with that right now. So if God mandates one to be a giver of alms, yes, everyone is to, is to give, but believe it or not, there are some who have been gifted, we'll look at it, who have been gifted of God to give alms. There are some who have been gifted of God to, to give alms in abundance or to help those in, who indeed cannot help themselves. To give alms or to help those who cannot help themselves. We call that the, we call that the, the, the ministry of helps, right? Uh, and he then must provide for them from his stores both resources and ample opportunities to be a benefaction. He must then create the opportunity. I don't know if you heard about Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, but it is my understanding that these two individuals are Christians. And so he has given them uh, from his stores. All things belong to him, and he has truly given them of his stores. They are billionaires, richest individuals on the planet. And he has given them from his stores that they might be benefactors. And benefactors is not benefactors receiving. Benefactors is people who are blessing individuals. You can see this in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and verses 8. You can see it also in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 14. Let me give it to you again. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 14. Again, that's talking about those who give sparingly receive sparingly those who give bountifully receive bountifully if you want to see a old testament expression of this go to malachi the levites were not required to give to themselves no the nation of israel were required to give to the levites so that the levites would not have to go out and work paul talks about in corinthians i see i'm, I'm, I'm getting into it now paul talks about don't muzzle the ox and that, that, that it is, it is, I believe that's 1 Corinthians 15. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. I might have the coordinates wrong. But it's in Corinthians where Paul talks about the fact that if a person labors in the gospel, then it is not wrong for them to receive from the labor in the gospel. In other words, it is not wrong to give a preacher an offering. And therefore, that means those who are receiving from the preaching of the preacher and of the teacher, it is, uh, it is their good work to give an offering. It is their good work. This is not about begging. This is not about pleading. This is not about, because we know in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 14, it says not to give of coercion. In other words, if you invite me to come as a preacher to do the work of preaching, then you determine what I am to receive. And it is a blessing. It is a good work that you give that. It is a good work. I'm all in next week. So, so then... So the implication of Ephesians chapter two verses verse chapter Ephesians chapter two verse ten is that one of the one of the implications is that God mandates the works to be done in and therefore He's going to give the power, the provision, the anointing, whatever is necessary. He's going to give from His stores so that His will, so that His good works are completed. Got it? Again because he desires them to be done. Well, look at what those good works are next week. So you got to come back. Because he desires for the good works to be done, then he will make every provision to these we call Christians to see those works get done. Let me encourage you real quick. I don't usually do this during Bible study, but if you're sitting here saying, God, what do you want me to do? Here's what the Bible says. Whatever your hand find to do, According to your several ability, now that's there's two different scriptures. Whatever your hand find to do, do it with all your might. Another scripture says, uh, 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 according to your several ability, be it unto you. Put those thoughts together. In other words, when you're asking God, God, what do you want from me? I ask you, what has He provided for you? What 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 has He given you from His stores? Then it speaks to the good works, and then I'll give you the good works next week, and it might help bring your life. To focus. Oh, those are the kind of things I can do. I got a I, I, God has blessed my bank account. I'm doing all right. My, my my retirement is good. My 401k is strong. I got an abundance to give. I've been giving my tithes and offerings. God, I believe there's more you want me to do. And then we'll look at next week. You might be able to be a, a, a greater benefit 
to the body of Christ. Finally, the final implication, it's going to be a short lesson tonight, the final implication of these words is that these works are works of necessity. So when I'm reading Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and it says, created his creation created in Christ, I have to understand that this is, these are works of necessity. Certainly, it must be that if he sought to save those who feel this group from their sins by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son, it stands to reason that if he, 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 he gifts them with his own presence, it stands to reason that if he saves us from our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness and then gifts us with his own presence to be an indwelling, to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if he goes through that so, so that we might be set aside, then it, it's, it's not an understatement to then understand that we all of this has happened so that we can do the good works and therefore be his creation created in Jesus Christ. Then these works must be of grave necessity. These works must be, hear me, these works must be of grave necessity. Before we dive into a more specific examination of some of these good works, let us be perfectly clear. We have not been saved to do what is evil, but neither, obviously, but neither have we been saved to exist as a, in spiritual safe mode. It just got a little tough right there. I was, move, I was moving smooth, but let me slow it down. Not only were we saved from evil that we might not continue in sin but we have not been saved to sit in a spiritual safe mode or in survival mode until christ's second coming there are good works to be done that which god has set aside for the elect in christ to accomplish does not permit sideline side type faith where these works will these works we will examine again. I've been saying it next week. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to entice you to come back. Afford us to be useless in the eyes of our Creator. In other words, the reason for these good works is so, in, in large part, is so we are not ultimately useless. Again, we alluded to it, James chapter 2. I show my faith by my works. Essentially, what James was addressing was this uselessness in the body of Christ that he was seeing. That many would say, no, I have faith, you have works. I'm a, and, I, and I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. Please understand, I'm not going there, but let's be real about this thing, that essentially what we are seeing, what, are, what is happening even to this day in the body of Christ, there are many who, even on social media, who are quick to say, I am a Christian, and yet there is nothing that is, there is, nothing that is coming from them, whether it's the works of their lips, it is the works of their hands, their words, actions, and deeds, that suggest a bona fide faith in Jesus Christ. If you are saying you are a Christian, filled with the Holy, precious Holy Ghost, and that would fire, then there ought to be some good works. Again, because we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That which God has set aside for the elect in Christ to accomplish does not permit sideline type faith, where these works we will examine in the week to come afford us to be useless in the eyes of the creator not talking about my eyes not talking about my sister's eyes my brother's eyes no in the eyes of the creator genesis chapters one and two reveal that from the beginning watch this watch this mankind was meant to be active participants in the governing and keeping of the world from the beginning humankind was always meant to do something we were never put on this planet as God's expression, his likeness, having his likeness in his image, whether male or female, he made them in his likeness and in his image. And so therefore, we are not here to just be here. We're not here to be useless. We are here to be useful. One man, God rest his soul, by the name of uh, 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 Pastor John Boykin, died, I believe, close to 100 years old. Uh, had a saying, uh, God uh, uh, is not concerned with our comfort, but he's concerned with our usefulness. So then how much more then 
if Adam and Eve, who are our foremost fathers, who were created for activity, and, and of course, precise activity, not just simply to be living and doing whatever they will. No, they were created to do and to complete the will of God, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. They were put in the garden to keep it. They were to be stewards. That word dominion is dealing with dominion. The dominionship, if you will, is dealing with stewardship. To, to, to have authority over the earth is not to be in, to say, I own it. No, it is to, 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 to manage it in accord to the one who put them in, in position. So then how much more then for those who are being saved to the active work set aside for us by our creator and our savior. So I, I hope this, this, this gets you set up for what we're going to deal with next week. It should be, it should be, uh, and I won't make promises, the conclusion of the matter. Uh, 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 thank God we were able to get through the program despite the, the inclement weather uh, uh, out there. God be praised. Be blessed, brothers and sisters. Uh, some of you may have been blessed. Uh, God may be leading you and dealing with you about uh, uh, the works of giving for the sake of the ministry. Uh, and you've been giving. You may be the person that I mentioned in the lesson that you've been giving to your church. You've been blessed abundantly, even in, <clears throat> even in sparse times. God has blessed you. You might not be uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, but if I am talking to Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, hey, victory in Christ. <laughs> uh, bless you. Uh, but you may be one of those people that God has blessed to be able to give above and beyond tithes and offerings that you give at your local uh, church. I please ask you to consider, speak to the Holy Spirit, and if he's leading you in this way, uh, uh, maybe you can extend the works of giving and be a benefit to this ministry. I am full-time in the ministry. Uh, I'm here every week. I desire and yearn to be here. I'm sure glad the weather held up so I could be here. Uh, we, we, we bless you today. If God is not leading you in that way, I do understand, brothers and sisters, whatever God is giving you to do, we'll hit that next week. So if you've been wondering what God wants from you, catch me next week. And we will get into it with depth. Uh, and we'll talk about those works. But if God has blessed you to give and you've been feeling that earn, yearning in your spirit to do a little bit more than what you do at your local church or in your, your local ministry, I ask you to consider giving to the ministry. It will come to me and it, I, I assure you will be a benefit. It will help me to be able to continue to, to come here week after week, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and first and third Sundays. God be, God be praised. You be blessed. Have a great rest of the week. See you Thursday, 9 Central Standard Time for Sunday School and Review. Be blessed.